So now that we've been talking about magnetic field due to a charge, a point charge that it is moving, let's move up to a current carrying wire. So a wire that has current. So let's say I just have a long straight wire here. It has current flowing. Using the traditional definition of current, we have current is the flow of positive charges. So if I put my thumb in the direction of the current, my fingertips represent the direction of the circles that the magnetic field would loop around this wire. So if my wire is flowing, moving, pointing towards the top of the page, my fingertips point towards me to the left of my thumb. So the magnetic field would point towards me on the left side of this wire. It will point away from me on the right side of this wire. But the magnetic field lines are continuous, so it makes circles all the way around, and that would be... Uh, counterclockwise circles if we're looking down on the wire from above. Okay, if we want to find the strength of the field though, we need to build upon our equation for our charge. So to find the magnetic field due to a single charge. The equation is mu naught times the charge, Q, times the velocity, how fast that charge is moving, crossed with R hat, which is just the direction that points direct, radially away from the charge to the point we care about. And then R in the denominator is how far away we're trying to find the field. Now, this wire, of course, is not a single charge that is moving. But we know that current is the rate at which charge is moving. Now velocity, we know, is a derivative of posi position with respect to time, a ds dt. So generically here, if I look in my equation and I have a q, times the ds dt, if I think of our current carrying wire as a whole bunch of charges moving per time, I can actually write this, and actually I should technically say db, meaning the magnetic field due to any infinitesimally little point charge, is mu naught dq dt, if I combine those, I get I, the current. But I'm still left with the ds, and then crossed r hat over 4 pi r squared. So similarly to what we did with electric field, where we found the electric field that any tiny little infinitesimally small piece of charge was contributing at a point. And if we wanted to add all of the electric fields due to each point charge, we essentially integrated. The same is true here. What we mean by ds is that any teeny tiny piece of this wire could be considered a small segment of one nice little charge moving in the direction of the current. And all of these little ds's are going to contribute to the overall magnetic field at some point. And by adding those up, each of their contributions, we can find the overall magnetic field at that point. So this equation, when we say we can find the overall magnetic field at a single point by adding up the current flowing through a bunch of little infinitesimally small lengths, 
This is called the Bios of our law. This equation as written is perfectly valid even if the wire is not straight. It could be turned, it could make a loop, it could be in any given shape. But this represents that we need to add up all of those contributions. So we need to integrate. So let's do this for the situation I have drawn. Let's solve this integral for a long straight wire. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep our wire just vertical like that. current flowing upwards. Let's find the magnetic field. Now just for uh, convenience sake, we do want a coordinate system in order to talk about these vectors. So I'm gonna just go ahead and say, we're trying to find the magnetic field at point A. And I'm gonna just generically use a lowercase a to represent that is the horizontal distance from the wire over to this point, a. So lowercase a means the distance, so between the wire and where we're finding the field. Now we can use the right hand rule to find the direction as we mentioned before, the magnetic field circles the wire. And if we put our thumb in the direction of the current, so point our thumb towards the top of the screen, our fingertips are representing that the magnetic field will make uh, counterclockwise circles if I look down from where, from up here. So at point A, point A, is directly to the right. So I'm on my picture to the left still. The field specifically at a given location is tangent to the circle. Tangent to the circle would be that way. <coughs> now looking just straight on, I would know that the magnetic field points into the screen. If my wire is on the y-axis, then into the screen would be the negative z direction. So if x is this way and y is this way, positive z comes out towards us. This is called a right-handed coordinate system, which is where this right-hand rule comes from. So we have the direction of the magnetic field, which means essentially we just need to find the magnitude of B. So instead of the in writing this equation in vector notation, the magnitude we can write the cross product as the magnitude of ds times the magnitude of our hat times the sine of the angle specifically between those two vectors. Well, the magnitude of ds, I'm just going to leave as a ds. The magnitude of r hat is simply the number 1 because it's a unit vector. So by definition, it just has the length of 1. We still have sine of phi in there to get just the perpendicular components. And then the 4 pi over r squared in the denominator. So this is the equation we're going to set up, but we need to get everything in terms of one single variable, okay? Right now, having ds is saying that we're integrating with an s as our variable, but there's no other s as a variable. So we need to think through some little piece of charge or 
wire, I should say. So some little piece of wire, ds. The vector is just in the direction of the current. The length of this is whatever, I'm going to call it a dy, since our wire itself is lying along the y-axis. This is similar to what we did with the electric field. We call it just the length in terms of the uh, variable that we're using. So the wire's on the y-axis, so I'm going to say ds is dy. Now, I have a whole bunch of options of my little ds's. So each little segment of wire is going to be contributing to the magnetic field at point A. But the distance from each piece of wire to point A is changing. As is the angle, so our hat points towards point A along R, the angle here between DS and R hat is also changing. So we need to get R and phi in terms of what is changing. Okay, so if we think of any one of these, say the bottom one, this bottom piece of wire is a distance of y below point A and a distance of x, which we're calling A, to the uh, left of point A. So just using Pythagorean theorem, the x-axis intersects the y-axis at a right angle. So we can say r is simply equal to y squared plus a squared. y is changing. Each piece of wire here is a different y distance away. The angle, this angle in here, let me just draw my picture below of what I mean by A. So this is the distance between my DS I'm talking about up to the origin and then a distance of A over to this point where we're trying to find the field. Our hat points along this line. So R is just the distance, the straight line distance from the piece of charge to this point we're trying to find the field at. R hat is the unit vector that lies along that line. DS is defined as the direction of the current. So when we have sine of phi in our equation that comes from the cross product, that phi must be the angle between the ds vector and the r hat vector. And so it's between our y-axis and r in this case. If we think about sine of phi, sine is the opposite side, which is a in this triangle, divided by the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse has a length of r in this case. But r, as we've already looked at, is the square root of y squared plus a squared. So sine of phi is equal to a divided by the square root of y squared plus a squared. As we think of each individual little piece of wire, so each of these little ds's up here, a this distance is not different for all of them. That's not changing. They are all a distance of that lowercase a to the left of the point we're looking at. But they're a different distance of y. So y is our variable. Okay. I'm going to write this again up here so I can... 
move this screen over. So I'm just rewriting the same equation so I can go ahead and slide over. We need some room to work with. So we're going to find this magnetic field, but what we're going to do is we're going to plug in ds, I'm calling dy. And again, ds is dy simply because the current is moving along the y-axis. So if I want to think about a tiny short segment of wire, it lies along the y-axis as well, so it will have a length of dy. In place of sine of phi, I'm going to put our a over the square root of y squared plus a squared. And then I have 4 pi r squared, so the square root of y squared plus a squared squared. Let me draw this a little bit better. That sine of phi would look like this in here. Our limits of integration need to represent the y, where on the y-axis this wire is located. Well, we're talking about a long, so we're going to assume infinitely long, so negative infinity to positive infinity, as long as we can possibly have it. Now, mu naught is a constant. I is a constant. A is a constant. So I'm just pulling all my constants out in front of the integral. 4 pi is a constant. So in here, I still have dy, and then I have this quantity of y squared plus a squared square rooted three times. So that's to the 3 halves power. This integral is one we've seen before. In fact, we saw this when we were solving for the electric field at some point that was not on the axis of the linear of the line of charge when we had to figure out x and y components. This integral is on the back page of the test notes. Now, it is written in terms of x and not y but that's okay. It tells us that the result, let me turn to my back page here. The result of this integral was plus or minus x divided by a squared, x squared plus or minus a squared. Okay. So to apply this to our integral, y is our variable instead of x. So what this means, I'm going to write down all the constants again because they're still here. But this integral, the sine plus or minus comes from the sine in our integral. Since we have a plus sign, we'll just have y over a squared times the square root of y squared plus a squared. And then we do need to plug in these limits. Okay, so this equation, or integral rather, we don't need to solve our own on our own because we have that result on the last page of the test notes. Okay, let's keep going here. If you notice, we have an a and an a squared now due to the result of the integral. I'm going to go ahead and cancel one of those, and I'm going to pull this a to the left. Pull it out, because that's not a variable. Now we're going to run into a bit of an issue right here. I'm going to get infinity over infinity, which does not 
mean one per se. So I need to think this through here. Our wire, if we think of point A and the current, the right hand rule, putting my thumb in the direction of this current, whether I'm talking about a piece down here or a piece up here, I get into the page for both pieces. Meaning, if these pieces are the same distance away from point A, they contribute in the same way to the magnetic field. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change my limits to be zero to infinity and multiply by two. Everything above the origin is going to give me the same as below. So instead of having my limits go from negative infinity to positive infinity, I'm going to multiply by 2, because they're both doing the same thing, and go from 0 to infinity. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to simplify this. So out here I'm going to have mu naught and an i and 2 pi a. I'm still running into the same issue though. If I plug in infinity, I'm still getting infinity over infinity. But if I plug in zero, I get zero. So we still need to figure out this upper limit, plugging in the infinity. Now, the trick I like to do in this case, and it's not really a trick, I'm multiplying by both top and bottom by 1 over y. When I do that in the numerator, that just becomes 1. In the denominator, I want to pull that 1 over y in. So I end up with needing to square it, and then both of them, the y squared and the a squared, end up divided by y squared. Doing this is not changing anything. 1 over y divided by 1 over y is the number 1. So I'm not changing my number. I'm just drawing it in a slightly different way. This becomes 1 over the square root of 1 plus a squared over y squared. So this is just another way of representing this original fraction we ended up with. Now though, if I put in infinity for y, Down here, if that's infinity, I have some number a squared over infinity squared. This term's going to go to zero. So I'm left with one over the square root of one. So I am left with one. This tells me that the magnetic field due to our long straight wire has a magnitude of mu naught i over 2 pi a. And again, what do we mean by a? Well, coming back to our original picture, a, this lowercase a, represented the distance, just straight line distance from the wire out to the point we were interested in. This is a nice simple solution that we can totally use now. Now, just a side note, in the test notes, and you will see it in a couple examples in the book as well, they write this as mu naught over 2 pi d. By d, we simply mean the distance from the wire to the point we're trying to find the field. Sometimes students think diameter, that is not diameter. We don't use a lowercase d to mean diameter. It simply means the straight line distance from the wire to the point we are interested in, where we want to find the field.
Now in the test notes, you will also see an arrow. This equation in of itself does not give us the direction. We have to find the direction from the right hand rule. So this equation, we don't need to derive it again. We can totally use this solution for any problem that we're solving that involves a long straight wire. And so we'll do some examples as well to represent that and show you how to use the equation.